All right. Good morning. It looks like uh, some of you guys are joining in. Oh, this is amazing. We have people from Australia, all the way from Australia, Australia, checking us out, mate. And it is so good to see you guys there. I see you. All right. We got others joining in with us. And uh, man, what a great time of worship together, right? What the, oh, I'm, I'm so grateful for that worship band and leading us before the throne. I hope your hearts are full, that your cup is overflowing. And uh, I know I know mine is. Boy, I want to thank Dave for that song. That really stirred my heart. Uh, talking about us, talking about we as uh, married couples. And we've been going through the letter to the Colossian church. And we, I, I kind of tried to prep you a little bit about this. We were going to do a series within the series. And that's because the text, when we get to chapter 3 towards the end, the uh, the text kind of dictates that. So what we're doing is uh, we're talking about family. We're talking about the different things that the Apostle Paul addresses for this Colossian church uh, there in chapter 3 and chapters 4. And last week uh, we talked about uh, women and wives. This week we're going to talk about men and husbands, next week is going to be a doozy, uh, covet your prayers, we're going to talk about sexuality, we're going to talk about communication, we're going to talk about being a good employer, employee, we're going to talk about singleness, it's, it's, uh, it's going to get wild, and I really pray that you guys will be blessed by this series within the series, and we only have uh, two uh, sermons after that to wrap up the letter of the Colossians, and um, I'm hoping that Everybody is encouraged. I'm looking forward to getting back together. We are following the bigger church leads on that uh, on that note. We're following the recommendations as well by our state and health officials. Uh, we're so grateful for them. You know, God appoints these folks over us, um, and uh, we should be thankful for those folks that are trying their best to uh, to take care of us and to guide us and direct us. And um, you know, regardless of uh, uh, how you feel ab about uh, those things, you know, the reentry folks, the stay-at-home folks, we're shepherding between two worlds here. Um, you know, we're, we're thankful for those health officials and uh, our governor for trying to uh, look out for us that way. And um, I, we're looking at probably uh, the next couple of weeks, you know, we're, we're, we're shooting for the first week of June, like a lot of churches are. Some have already started earlier, um, but we're, we're preparing. We want to be ready to receive and praise the Lord, just like we did with the worship man just now. So as we get into this text, uh, I want to pray for us, and let's, uh, let's, get, let's get going. Father God, I just want to come to you, pause and acknowledge your goodness and grace. And Lord, you are a good, good Father. You're the Father that we've always needed. Your Son, Jesus, is the greatest eldest brother, Lord, Savior, the universe has ever known and needs to know. Uh, and have. And so we are grateful for him. We are grateful for your Holy Spirit going before us for inspiring the very words of scripture uh, written by men, yet inspired by the Holy Spirit and carried along uh, from thought to thought and word to word. And I just pray that what's said and done here will, will build up your kingdom. I pray that uh, men would desire to be godly men following Christ that they would be, desire to be godly husbands as well, those who will marry. And so we uh, thank you for going ahead of us. Uh, help me to say the things you want me to say and to uh, not say the things you don't want me to say. So we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, like we did last week, uh, I want to give you a couple of uh, uh, book recommendations. And, and yes, hopefully you've gotten your Corona haircut by now. I have the swoop is still strong. Side note, it's all good. I feel like more of a man now, I guess, now that I got my haircut. So I'm kind of pumped. But I, I recommended some books for the uh, women last week, and I want to recommend some books for the men. Um, one, a, a short read that's a really good book is called The Masculine Mandate. A fantastic book, Masculine, The Masculine Mandate by uh, Richard Phillips. Uh, there's also a book called A Guide to uh, Biblical Manhood. I actually know these guys who wrote that book, Randy Stinson and Dan Dumas, and um, fantastic little read there. You know, that's a little bit more practical 
with regard to advice. Uh, the masculine mandate is a little bit more in-depth as far as uh, the doctrine and theology of, of manhood. And then there's another, there's all kinds of good books out there about this, but another one is um, a biography, actually. It's called Good Christians, Good Husbands, Question Mark. It's written by Doreen Moore, and it's about John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and what they preached and taught about marriage, <clears throat> but also, you know, how they, how they lived it out. So uh, those are three recommended books for you to check out and um, learn and grow as men, but also to grow as husbands. And uh, I showed you a picture last week of my uh, mother <clears throat> and father and said that I learned a lot about uh, godly wives and godly women from my mother, but I also learned a lot about what it means to be a godly man and husband from my father. And uh, here's a little little picture. Uh, he looks familiar. Uh, yes, it kind of, let me get it closer. There you go. It, it kind of looks like me, I know, but it's actually my father on a little pony, I guess, a little horse, <clears throat> you know, and uh, one day this little guy grew up to become a godly man, to become a godly husband. Uh, he didn't stay this way. And the, the, uh, the, the reason I say that is that, that godly men are not born. Godly men and godly husbands are not born. They're made. <clears throat> They're made by the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that little boy on that pony uh, grew up to become a great godly man of God who uh, poured into us, and we got to watch him, how he interacted with people. We got to learn from him like we learned from our mother about being a godly woman, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And so I learned a lot about godly manhood and uh, being, being a godly husband from him, <clears throat> but I also learned it from the Bible. And last week, we talked about women and wives. This week, we're talking about men and husbands. And uh, as we get into this, you you may be tempted to, to kind of check out, but uh, women. But but let me give you some advice here. As you're listening, uh, it could be a little bit of admonishment too. <clears throat> as you're listening to this particular message, you're going to be tempted to kind of poke and pride and stick and you know poke with your elbow, and you're going to say to yourself, uh huh. Uh, did you hear that? Did you hear what Pastor Barry just said? Amen, brother. Preach it. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I get it, but that won't help. That won't help. And here, here's why that won't help. What what you want your husband to to be, to become, is for him to love and to follow Jesus Christ in such a way that you don't have to poke, you don't have to pride, you don't have to nag, but you follow him and say, thank you, Lord, for the godly husband that you have given me. Because if you poke and pride and nag him as a leader, kind of like uh, with a cattle pride, then you're leading. You're leading him and he will never, he will never pick up the baton and run with the baton. You'll have a religious version of the man that you already have. You'll have a religious version of the man that you already have. And so uh, I know it's tempting to do that. I know the men were, were thinking last week the same thing. Uh, you know, like, uh-huh, honey, did you hear that? But, uh, you, you know, we don't, we don't want to do that. So uh, that's just to, to the women listening. We love you. You're awesome. Thank you so much for uh, following Christ. To the men, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. So let's start with the bad news. Here's the bad news. You will never be able to stand up under the weightiness and the glory of God's standards for what it means to be a godly man and a godly husband. You'll never be able to do that. That's the bad news. But therein is the good news as well. That's part of why Jesus came. Part of why Jesus came is not only to redeem your soul, but to restore you, to restore your biblical manhood, to restore you as a godly husband, because Jesus is the perfect man. 
In fact, he's the perfect God man. And we praise God for him. God doesn't want you uh, to despair, thinking I'll never live up to the standard, Pastor Barry, I'll never be able to arrive to that. Uh, but he doesn't want you to be arrogant either. He doesn't want you to say, man, I've arrived. Look at all these losers out here. You know, they, they are awful uh, people who are not godly and not godly men and husbands. He doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't want you to despair. He doesn't want you to be arrogant. He wants you to be a Christ follower because it's good for you, good for the others around you who are connected to you and glorifying to God. Here's a reality. Everybody loves a hero. Everybody Love the hero, and everybody wants to be a hero. I mean, the best of stories, right, are those that involve sacrificial love where where the, the hero is laying down their lives for the other one. The man, in this case, is uh, is defending the girl that he loves. The bullets start flying. He jumps on the girl. He gets shot. He dies. She lives. Everybody loves those kinds of stories where the man is masculine and he is protecting and providing and protect, uh, pr providing and protecting in that case. Um, and in some sense, you know, that that's true for all of us. And in some sense, though, that's easy. That's actually easy. And here's why. That's just a moment. That's just a blink of an eye. That's a rush of adrenaline. That's a snap of the fingers where the man makes a split second decision to jump in, which is very honorable, which is very noble, and even glorifying to God. But that's just a moment. That's just a snap of the fingers. Christian men, though, are not called to a moment of greatness. They are called to a lifetime of godly obedience. Karen Ho uh, once said this. She said, uh, "Most women, most women, and this will resonate right with the late with the women of of our church and community. Most women don't want their men to die for them. They want them to live for them." I know you're saying amen secretly in your heart. That's true, right? Most women don't want their men to die for them. Most women want their men to live for them. They want their husbands to live for them. So here's our goal today with this passage in Colossians 3, men, is yes, we want to walk away from this message, willing to die for our spouse, willing to die for our children, our family, our church, our community, willing to do that. But we want to walk away as changed men, willing to live a godly life before them, willing to live with them in this godly manner. And that's our goal for today. But where do we start, right? Uh, wh where do we start with this? Do we need to start with, uh, you know, with the culture and what the culture thinks about manhood and, and what it means to be a husband? Uh, do, we need to, do we need to talk about the spectrum here? Do we need to talk about the spectrum of wimps versus bullies, right? And everybody in between. <clears throat> do we need to talk about what your wife thinks about this or what she thinks about the family or those connected to you. Uh, and, and here's the reality. No, we're going to start with the Bible and we're going to start with our church because that's what we know best. I'm going to talk about our men at City on a Hill Church. I'm going to talk about our men and we're going to start with the Bible. And that's where we're going to start today. Um, here's number one. For the men at City on a Hill Church, there are no perfect men in our church. There's only one perfect man in our church, and his name is Jesus Christ. There are no perfect men in our church, but there are faithful men in our church. There are faithful, wonderful men in our church. They are faithful to Christ. They are faithful to their spouse. They are faithful to their kids. They are faithful to their jobs. They are faithful to their church. They are faithful to their community. They're, they're the kind of men that work full-time jobs, and they come home, and even though they're tired, they, uh, they want to spend time with the kids. They're the kind of men that come home from work, and their wife is sick, and they're willing to make them a bowl of soup with crackers and, and, and a Sprite. Uh, 
They're the kind of men that want to take care of the family, spend time with one another. Uh, that's, that's God's grace on their lives. Many of you have said to me personally behind the scenes that you are a better man because you have been at City on a Hill Church. And that makes my heart full and my cup runs over. And I am so thankful for that. We have faithful men here at City on a Hill Church. It, it, is, it is the envy of, of, of any pastor in, in the very purest sense of, of that word. So we do have men like that. Uh, but here at City on a Hill Church, like any church, um, there's also men here <clears throat> who have room to grow. Everybody has room to grow as men, as husbands. No man in our uh, church is Jesus Christ. Nobody. But by God's grace, we can grow in that grace together as godly men, together as godly husbands. We have sin in us, and we have been sinned against by others. So we've committed sins, and sins have been committed against us. In other words, we live in a broken world with broken men, broken husbands who point to the only person who is perfect, whose name is Jesus Christ. That's some men in our church, right? Some men here could be presumptuous of uh, our, our wife's respect. We think that our wife will respect us because of our title. We think our wife will respect us because of who we are as husbands. We, we act in a way that assumes that respect instead of earning that respect. Some men at COA are, are paralyzed and they're intimidated by their wife's gifts. They're, they're intimidated by her talents, her gifts, her ability, and her growth. Uh, you know, what, what, the, what I mean by that is we're so grateful for our spouse that we idolize her. We put her on a pedestal and give her a status that she could never deliver on. It's, it's, it's crushing for her to kind of, to try to live up to that standard. And that's, that's what idols are. They're, they're, they're good things made into ultimate things that can't deliver on what they promise. And there's a lot of men who can't even engage with their spouses. They can't even correct them. They can't even lead them because they're scared of them. Maybe your wife is is fiery and strong, and man, we we got a we got a truckload of them at City on a Hill Church. You know, praise the Lord for these women who are like that. And maybe they're fiery and strong, and maybe you're intimidated by that. And the Bible says you're not supposed to be intimidated by that. You are to be thankful for that. They are a gift to you from the Lord, and and you accept them as a total package. Uh, Koa men. Um, are, are engaged at work. And City on a Hill church men are not workaholics, but they're get engaged in work. You have current working men, you have retired men who give up their time, their talents, their treasures, their resources. And they're, and they're just, they're, they're givers. They are passionate about it. But there may be a temptation where, where home is actually your vacation spot. You're passionate about work and providing and doing things, but home is kind of your vacation spot where you come home, you check out, you veg out. Uh, you can, it's the kind of deal where, you know, you can lead a multi million dollar corporation, but you can't lead your home. There may be men like that in our church. There may be men in our church who are distracted in their distance. I mean, man, we are more connected because of technology than ever before, but never have we been more absent. Never have we been more absent while we have been connected. It's, it's a weird kind of a conundrum, you know? Um, you, you know what your 40K, your 401k looks like. You, you know what your Twitter account looks like. You're up to date with your, uh, you know, with your sports page and your facts and information and the life of LeBron James and Kobe Bryant and, and, uh, you know, your Edward Jones accounts and whatnot, but you're not up to date with your family. 
You don't really know what's going on with your family. That could be some men in our church. Uh, and lastly, Koa men desire to do what God wants us to do. I have never met a man, I've never met a husband who loves Jesus, who wants to be a sorry father. I've never met a man that loves Jesus who wants to be a sorry husband or a terrible husband or a terrible leader. I've never met a man who is a Christ follower who wants to forget his wife and kids and not become a better leader. I've never met a man like that before in uh, 26 years of, of ministry. Maybe your issue is just fear. Maybe your issue is fear of failure. Maybe you've never had this modeled for you. Maybe you did not have a good, good earthly father, but you have a good, good and great heavenly father that has not only modeled this for you, he has saved you and restored you to this through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have the ability within you through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the word of Christ, to become a person who is not settled, but a person who is growing and growing in that grace into the head, which is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we get into this, all of these things are not true of everyone. They're not, they're not all true of everyone, but some of these things are true of all of us. Some of these things are true of all of us. And God has called us to something greater. God has called us to something better. And we're going to start with the Bible. We're going to start right where it began in Genesis chapter 2 with uh, biblical masculinity. Men, according to Genesis chapter 2, are called to reflect, to be benders of the light of God's glory as image bearers. You are to be a reflector of God's glory, uh, a worker and a keeper of God's resources and God's mission while bearing primary responsibility for himself and those entrusted to you. So let me say that again. Men are called to reflect God's image as a worker and keeper of God's resources on God's mission while bearing the primary responsibility for himself and those entrusted to him. We get this from, from uh, Genesis chapter 1 where a man is made in the image of God. You are a mirror, you're a, a reflector and bender of the light and the glory of God. And we get this from Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And here's what the inspired word says. The Lord God took the man. It's like a father grabbing his son's hand. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. In that passage, what we learn is that long before man was even married, before man was married, he was to reflect the image of God. He was to be a worker and the keeper as a steward of God's resources. So here's what this means for single men. If you're single men, you have a calling and a mission, and it's to reflect God's image as a worker and keeper. If you're married, you're to do the same thing. Man bears the primary responsibility to provide for himself. God says to Adam in this passage, hey, you can eat from any of the trees of the garden. You can eat the fruit of any of these trees. They're all yours, man. This entire garden is all yours. Enjoy, take care of yourself. But don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in, in Genesis 2, 23 to 24 and following, God gives him the gift of a wife. And he literally says in the original language, whoa, wow, amazing. I've got one for myself, just like the animal kingdom has two, two, two. I've got one for myself. Thank you, God. She is co-equal with man in essence, yet she is different in function, as we saw last week. Adam is called to protect 
and to provide and steward even before he gets together with Eve. And, and God brings Eve to Adam as the first officiate, if you will, of that marriage union. God is the marriage officiate of that ceremony. It's pretty pretty amazing. Adam is called to provide, to protect, and steward all of that. I mean, what an honor. But then we get to Genesis chapter 3, and they eat from the wrong tree. And in chapter 3, verse 9, it says, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And if you noticed, he didn't call to them. He didn't call to Adam and Eve. He called out to the man and he said, where are you? Men, we bear the primary responsibility for ourselves and those entrusted to us. Men don't shirk off responsibility. Godly men don't shirk off responsibility. Men own up to it. We own up to it and we say the buck stops here. The buck stops here with me. If you're the kind of man, if you're the kind of person that when corrected by somebody, you blame three other people, you're not acting as a man. You're not acting as a godly man for sure. We don't have sole responsibility, but primary responsibility for ourselves and for those entrusted to us. Once again, single men, that includes you and all of those connected to you. That includes you and those connected to you in your sphere of influence. Married man, that includes you. That includes your spouse and your children and, of course, those connected to you. There's, there's a little bit extra in there for you. And uh, what that means for married men is this. Your wife, men, may do the laundry. In fact, my wife chooses to do the laundry. I, I, uh, bad story. I shrunk a dress after washing it when we were first married, and it, and it shrunk down to like a Barbie doll-sized dress. Um, apparently, I didn't know what I was doing. So your wife may choose to do the laundry, but it's not her fault if you can't find your pants. You got to be a man, and you got to find your pants, right? You bear primary responsibility for yourself, even if she's washing your clothes, even if she's doing other things for you. Maybe she's acting like a mama and treating you like a child because you're acting like a child. And so we, we've got to uh, we got to realize that. We bear primary responsibility for ourselves. And then, of course, for others. Now, last week, we kind of struck a chord when I said uh, wives are the ones who are responsible for their walk with Jesus. Women, wives, your walk with Jesus is your walk with Jesus. And that really struck a chord with a lot of the, the women in the church. And then, of course, the men said last week, hallelujah, hallelujah, I'm off the hook, baby. I don't... I don't have to do anything. She has to grow in the Lord by herself, and I'll grow by myself. But don't forget that when we looked at 1 Peter chapter 3, the context of that passage was a believing Christian woman, a spouse, who was married to an unbelieving person, a non-believer. So in that context, she was, uh, she was walking with Jesus by herself. For the Christian couple, the Christian man, the Christian woman, woman um, you know, yes, she will stand before the Lord and give an account for her walk with Jesus. But if you're a Christian husband, you are actually to guide and nourish and lead her in that walk as well, right? This is your home too. And, and men bear the primary, not the soul, but the primary responsibility for the spiritual leadership of the family. <clears throat> and that's why the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 3, 18 and 19, wives submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. We saw that last week. If you didn't listen to that message, please go listen to it. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So uh, what about husbands? What about husbands? He gives two things, and that's probably because men can only remember a few things. I don't know. 
uh, he says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. What, here's, here's what this doesn't mean. This does not mean, men, husbands, that you love all women. You, you cannot love all women. If you're married, you are to love this way only one woman. The woman, the spouse that God has given to you. It is referring to husbands, not men in general in, in this passage. We can talk about other passages later. But in this passage, he's talking about husbands. Who are the kind of men women are willing to follow? What's well, the kind of men who are the, the, the sacrificial leaders and heads of the home? The Bible talks about headship quite a bit. It says in Ephesians 5 that men are the head of the home like Christ is the head of the church. And the church is to, uh, the wife is to respect the husband like the church respects and follows and honors Jesus Christ. There's a complementarian nature of that relationship. And, uh, so we need to talk about that a little bit. What is headship, or rather, what is not headship? Let's talk about that first. Okay, headship is not a dictatorship. Man, there are too many men, too many husbands in churches who use these verses as billy clubs against women. This, you know, they say, this is the way it's going to be, woman. This is the way it's going to be. You're going to listen to me because I'm the head of the home and that's it. The buck stops with me. Solomon, King Solomon, uh, who had a little bit of experience with this, obviously, he said uh, about his spouse, this is my beloved and this is my friend. This is my beloved and this is my friend. Headship is not a dictatorship. Number two, it is, uh, it is not a selfish use of leadership. Your wife doesn't, her sole purpose in life is not to live for you. Her sole purpose in life is to live for Christ and to honor Christ and glorify him and be your helper. And we said that was a high standing with the Lord because the Holy Spirit, who is the very third person of the Godhead, is called the helper. And so uh, so we honor them and cherish them. She's not there to do whatever you want to do for your selfish causes. That's not headship. Headship is not superiority either. Listen, being the leader doesn't mean that you're the best at everything. You're not. You're not the best at everything. The best leaders know their limitations, they know their weaknesses, and they surround themselves with people who are stronger than them in their weaknesses. I mean, often idiots and morons act like that. Idiots and morons act like they're superior to their spouse when the Bible says you're not superior, you're equal in essence and nature, you're just different. And if you've been around men, women at any length of time, and they will say amen to this, uh, they are different. So we men can't figure them out. Well, guess what? Pick up the clue phone. They can't figure you out either. You know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. You remember the old book? It, there's a lot of truth to that. But that doesn't mean you stop growing together uh, as as co-laborers for the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you, it, I tell you what it does mean. You're, you're not to be a dictator. You're not to feel superior to her. And you're not to use her for selfish ambition. Here's what R. Kent Hughes wrote about being a godly man and husband. God's word in the hands of a religious fool can do immense harm. I have seen, I have seen, couch potatoes order their wives and children like the Sultan of Morocco, adulterous misogynist with the domestic ethics of a job of the hut who cow their wives around with Bible verses about submission, insecure men whose wives dare not go to the grocery store without permission, who even tell their wives how to dress. But the fact that evil disordered men have perverted God's word is no reason to throw it out. I like that. I think that's true. Um, these kinds of guys do exist, unfortunately, and uh, maybe uh, maybe you or I are one of them. It doesn't mean that we throw out the prescripts 
of the Bible. It doesn't mean that we throw out the word of of God. It means we need to be honest with ourselves and call a spade a spade and, and grow. We need to repent from our sin and grow in the knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, headship is a divine calling. It is a divine calling of a husband to take that primary responsibility for Christ-like servant leadership and protection and provision in the home. Number one, it's a divine calling. God set it up this way, you know, and a lot of women will ask pastors, they will say, um, you know, why Why did God set it up this way? And I can give you good biblical reasons. I can give you good theological reasons. But the, at the end of the day, the, the really only answer that we have is because he wanted to. I, I don't know why he set it up where the husband is the head and the wife is the helper and they complement one another that way. That's just the way that God set it up. And it has a greater spiritual and gospel truth where your marriage points to the Lord or should point to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and and it's, it's a divine calling. And men, husbands, you are to be the primary uh, provider and protector, not the sole provider and not the sole protector of the family as you are growing into that Christ-like leadership and protection. So listen, if an intruder comes into your home, your your wife may be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, American Ninja Warrior or something. She may be amazing, but you need to be the first to stop the guy. You need to try to, you know, get up and protect the family, protect your wife physically. You don't put your wife in harm's way. Your wife probably should drive the better car. Sorry, right? If you care and love her, she should probably drive the better car. You don't want her going on a long trip in, in, a, in a clunkety clunk car. You need to try to give her the best, right? You want to physically protect her. You want to spiritually protect and provide. You know, she has her own walk with Jesus, but you need to come along and and tell her what the Lord is doing in your life. And uh, maybe you need to correct her on some things. Maybe you need to encourage her. Maybe you need to pray for her, right? So you lead in God spiritually. You lead in God emotionally. You got to be, you got to learn how to navigate the emotions of a woman. And then you say, well, that's impossible. That I can't do that. They are so complicated. But you're called to do that. It's a divine calling to get to know your wife in an understanding way so that you can guide and protect and so that your marriage can image the gospel to a dying world. You know, uh, there's something about, there's something in a man, folks, there's something in a godly man, for sure, by the way, that wants to work and provide. There, there's something innate in us, going back to Genesis chapters 1 to 3, there's something innate in us that wants to provide, wants to protect, right? Just just talk to the man who's been out of work for a long time, who feels like a bum. Just Just talk to the man who feels like he's not providing and protecting his family. It's a real deal. The biblical reality married men, is is that you are already the head. It just, dep- it just depends on what kind of head you will be. It just depends on what kind of head you will be. And the apostle, who was not married, by the way, says, husband, love your wives. Husband, you're to love your wife. Believe it or not, this may be a little surprising to you. This would have been a very radical message. I'm serious. This would have been a very radical message back then where the apostle shows up and says to these husbands, um, hey guys, you're supposed to love your wife. You're supposed to love your wife. And here's why. Marriage for a lot of men back then and in that culture meant managing the household. I'm to run my household like a business. Uh, and that was normal for husbands. But loving them? Are you kidding me? This, this is why the apostles were so perplexed about D- Jesus' teachings uh, on marriage and divorce in, in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew. Are you, are you kidding me? Love them? I don't mind protecting them, providing mowing the grass, you know, and uh, managing the household, but I've, re- I've got to love them? This was counter-cultural for these folks back then. And I, and I have some questions for the men today. How do you love your wife counterculturally? 
How do you love her counterculturally? And here's here's my first question for you, men. Are you her lover? Are you her lover? Yes, are you her lover? Statistics show that married couples who spend quality time together weekly, check this out, are 3.5 times, 3.5 times, that's 350% times to uh, report being happier in their marriage. Shocker, right? Are you romancing your wife? Kevin DeYoung wrote, men should not marry so they could stop pursuing women. Men get married so we can perfect the pursuing of one woman over a lifetime. So men don't get married to stop pursuing other women. They get married to pursue that one wife for the rest of their lives. That's the way it was supposed to be. You, and here's the deal, man, uh, and you know this to be true. Uh, you got her once. I don't know what you did, but, but you got her once. You romanced her once. You need to keep up the chase. Are you her lover? Number two, are you her friend? Once again, Solomon said, this is my beloved. This is my friend. Over 70% of men and women said that the most important part, the most important part of their fulfillment in marriage was not the sex, but the friendship. The friendship. Over 70% of men and women interviewed said that the most fulfilling part of their marriage was the friendship in that marriage. Are you friends? Do you talk and stay up late together and talk about everything? Do you dream together? Do you pray together? Do you get ice cream together? Well, maybe not now during Corona, but, you know, I think they're open at Baskin Robbins, but you know, do you hang out together? Do you date one another? Are you friends? Do you get along that way? I mean, think about this. What happens when you wake up one day and your kids are out of the house and you've got 20 more years of life together after that last kid is out of the house? Have you ever wondered, I'm serious, have you ever wondered why so many people divorce in their late 40s and 50s? It's a midlife crisis for sure, but a lot of it is because they made their kids their idol and then the last kid leaves the house they go have families of their own, and you were never friends during that time. You were never buddies. You were never together. It was all about your kids' lives and making them number one. And here's the biblical deal, guys. Biblical deal, husbands. Your kids need to see you love your spouse more than the kids. Your kids need to see you love your spouse even more than the kids. Outside of Jesus Christ, it's, it's the kid's strongest foundation to see you loving your wife sacrificially. Even secular psychologists know this. You don't have to be a biblical theologian to know this. Even they know that the family, that couple, that husband and wife are the strongest foundation and building blocks for the kids. Your boys men will learn what it means to treat a woman by how you treat your wife. Little girls will learn how to treat a husband by watching how the wife treats the husband. That's how it works. And so are we lovers? Are we friends? And here's another one. Are you her partner? The biblical word fellowship in the Bible actually means partnership partnership. Eve was not an afterthought of Adam. She's part of the package deal. She is your helper. You are her leader. You work together as partners for the sake of the gospel. You pursue the mission of God together, the mission that God has for both of you together. Men is the partnership 
big. Is the vision you have for your marriage a God-sized vision? Or is it just to survive and pay the bills? What kind of vision do you have for your marriage? Or does she view her role as kind of sitting on the bench? You know, she's not really a partner in the marriage. You know, she's sitting on the bench. You sub her in when you need her. She's an extra hitter for the team uh, when you need her. And, 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 you know, it's getting crunch time. That's on you. That's on you as a husband. How big is your family vision? Do you have a god size vision? That's what it means to be a, a head of the family. You're her lover, you're her friend, you're her partner. First Peter 3, uh, we looked at that last week um, with regard to women and wives. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, right after that, though, says this, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. What in the world does that mean? Well, um, you know, if you look at uh, the NBA, if, if you look at the Olympics, uh, it's pretty obvious uh, that, that men and women are different. There's a reason they have a men's basketball league and they have a women's basketball league. And when the Bible says here that, that the woman is the weaker vessel, he literally means that, that she is literally weaker. The vessel here means body. I'm thinking of this uh, case up in Connecticut where you have these transgender, uh, they're, 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 bit, they're young boys uh, who think they're girls, and they want to run in the girls' track league. And they ended up, two of them ended up winning the championship because they were faster than the, than the girls. And, and that's kind of the idea here when it's talking about women being the weaker vessel. Uh, they are, they are physically, literally weaker in that regard. And it crushes the identity of the woman when the men try to be the women. And, and the, the apostle Peter here is saying, man, when it comes to your marriage, you need to think that way along those lines. You are so different than your wife. You don't want to lord your authority over her. That's how the Gentiles lead. Jesus said that I came to be a suffering servant, to lay down my life as a ransom for many. That's how you're to think of marriage. You're, you as the head of your family need to honor her. Here's what it says right after that controversial phrase because she is a co-heir with you. She is an equal heir with you, though she is different, just like the WNBA is different than the NBA, right? We need to understand our spouse. Do, do you see how personal this is? He's not trying to say that women are lesser than men in that regard, uh, in essence or nature. Uh, just only different in function. He's saying, listen, men, you are to love your wife, not their wife, not their wife, not women in general. You are to love your wife. In other words, it's easy to love somebody in general and not particular. It's easy to love somebody in general. It's easy to pick up a book on marriage by Tim Keller and read what marriage is. It's easy to go to a conference on marriage and absorb all kinds of information and hear a sermon on it like today. It's something else altogether to love my wife, for you to love your wife. You need to be an, what that means is, you need to be an active student of your wife. You need to continue to learn her. You need to continue to get to, to know her. The joy is in the journey. She's not the same woman <clears throat> at 22 as she is as at 40. And she's not the same woman at 70 or 80 as she was at 40. You need to continually learn her and be a student of your wife. You know, some of you married women who are a challenge and or they were a challenge 
to you at the beginning, and that's actually what drew you to them. You know, it's the conquering hero, and you want to you want to take on the challenge of this challenging woman. But somewhere down the line, you know, like after a, a week of marriage or six months, you say to yourself, "Oh man, where did that come from? What happened right there? I don't know uh, what I have gotten myself into." The Bible says. As a husband, you need to continually understand and grow and examine yourself and examine your spouse in order to serve her and lead and nourish and cherish her. You're, you see, here's the deal. You're going to have a, uh, a here's, here's what marriage can look like for some people. You have a back-to-back marriage. Your backs are up against each other. You're in dual position. You both got your revolvers, and you're going to march away, turn around and shoot each other, or go your own separate ways. That is self-driven. Or you're going to have a shoulder-to-shoulder marriage where you're, you're on mission together. You're driven for the same cause. But the Bible says that you are to have a face-to-face marriage. You are to have a face-to-face marriage. Certainly, that involves shoulder to shoulder. Certainly, it involves you working together for the mission of the gospel. But you're also to have a face-to-face marriage where you understand and examine one another that way. That's how you love your spouse as the head of your home. And then he says that uh, we are not to be harsh with our wives. We're not to be harsh. We, a lot of men have this idea that we are to be John Wayne in the family, John Wayne in the church, John Wayne, you know, or John Rambo in the church, John Rambo in the marriage, John Rambo in the community. And I love Rambo. I do. I, I got to confess. I love him. He, he's, he's, he's amazing. You know, one guy can take out 500 people at one time. It's incredible. But the Bible says that the true mark of a Christian man is gentleness. Yes, Jesus Christ could whip people out of a temple who who they who were using the temple of God for their own personal gain. But he's also the Christ that could welcome little children. He could hold little children and welcome them. And he, in fact, he scolded the adults for scolding the children that way. And and he he's gentle. You were drawn to Jesus, folks, because of his gentleness. He is Lord, he is sovereign, he is just, he has dealt the death blow to sin, he is the conquering king, but what drew you to him? What drew you to him was his love. What drew you to him was his gentleness and kindness. See, men, we we are to be strong men with soft hearts. I know too many Christian men that are just mean, They're just rear ends to their spouse. And it's no wonder the spouse doesn't respect him. It's no wonder that she won't follow him. He's lording these verses over his wife. Woman, you need to be barefoot, pregnant, and up next to the sink and doing whatever I tell you to do because I'm the man, I'm the husband. The buck stops here. That's not gentle. That's not gentle. That's not kind. That's not merciful. You can be strong on the interior um, uh, and, and, and soft and gentle on the exterior. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Brian Chapel, a uh, pastor, theologian, and professor, he wrote in the book, Each for the Other, he said this, Husbands who admire or are jealous for the strong women they see in other men's marriages intuitively recognize that such wives enable their husbands to fulfill their greatest potential. It's true. Behind every great husband is a great woman, a great wife. What men with such a longing may not realize, though, is that they play a part in making their wives strong. See, that's what that mutual submission in Ephesians 5 is talking about. What these men don't realize is, is, see, they look at other husbands' wives and they say, man, I wish my wife was like that. But they need to be looking at that husband and saying, maybe I need to be more like him. Maybe I need to be more like that godly guy. 
listen, all of us have seasons of, of greatness and, and uh, not so greatness, if you will. All of us have tough seasons. All of us have great seasons. But let me ask you this, husbands. Is your wife defeated? Is your wife deflated? Is, is your wife uh, overwhelmed? What, what are you doing as the leader to address that? How are you helping her flourish? The words in Ephesians 5 are that flourish and nourish and sacrifice. Men, here's the deal. You don't get to grade yourself on this. You don't get to grade yourself, sorry. You don't get to grade yourself and say, man, I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm pretty amazing as a husband. I'm pretty awesome as a father. She's the one that gets to grade this. She's the one that gets to grade this. Uh, you need to go to your spouse and say, honey, what can I do to change? What can I do to serve and flourish your life? What can I do to help you grow? Now, women, you know, uh, you don't get to, you don't, ha you can't get the hatchet out and, uh, you know, and, and chop away. Um, but you need to run to Jesus together. You need to run to Jesus together. You want to be able to stand hand in hand before the Lord and say, look what Jesus did. You want to stand before the King one day and say, look what he did in our marriage. He took two sinners and he blossomed our marriage into this beautiful story of a gospel mission where the, the husband as the head of the home sacrificially was laying down his life. He was stewarding the gifts and resources that God has, had given him for this gospel mission, for this grand vision for their marriage. And the wife said, I was willing to follow that kind of a leader and submit to him as the church respects and honors Jesus Christ. God did it, and he did it because of his grace and for his glory. That That's partly what it means to have a gospel marriage, to be gospel husbands and gospel wives. And uh, boy, I wish we could unpack, unpack the rest of that for uh, for you. There is so much more there, so many stones that need to be over turned and talked about. And pop, pop, maybe we'll have a panel discussion about this uh, in the near future. That, that would be great to hear the wisdom from other godly leaders in our church and, uh, and see how they grew in the Lord Jesus Christ together. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ uh, today, we, we want to say to you um, that uh, Jesus loves you and that he gave his life up for you, the just for the unjust. He was buried, he was crucified on a cross for the penalty and punishment of your sin. He was buried and risen again to new life. And if you turn from your sin and place your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You are not saved by being a godly man. You are a godly man because you are saved. You are a godly woman because you are saved. So you need to grow in that grace. For those who are single, keep growing in that direction in godliness. Keep growing. Keep serving. Keep influencing those in your spheres of influence. All of these godly characteristics work for married people and unmarried people in a sense. These passages, though, pertain to uh, the married couple. And so single people, keep growing in Jesus, fixing your eyes on him and serving him in that capacity. Married people, maybe you guys need to sit down and talk about these things. Maybe you need to evaluate where your marriage is and, and be honest with one another, yet be gracious. And maybe you need to repent and say, I'm sorry for not being the kind of godly husband or wife that I need to be. Let's, let's repent, pray, pray together. Let's forgive one another. And let's move forward and see what God is going to do through our marriage. It really is the grandest story of all for the married couple to look back on their life and say, God did it. God did it, and he brought us to the end, and he is so good and so gracious to give us Jesus, to give us one another, to give us our families, and uh, even to give us this mission for his uh, glory. So uh, City on Hill Church, we love you. 
greater community. Uh, we love you. We're grateful for you. We'd love to connect with you here in the near future. We're looking at probably uh, two weeks out, and we're going to be kicking back up into high gear. I think a lot of churches in our community will as well. We'll give you more information about that in the coming days ahead. God bless, and we pray that you will have a blessed Lord's Day today.